Well, how do you all feel this morning? So sorry, is that the wrong question? What do you know about God? Today we're continuing our look at Luke. And uh, there we go. We're going to continue our look at Luke. And the question I've been asking myself before each of these sermons is, who is Jesus? What do we know about Jesus? And Luke chapter 7 is, has four scenes. It's split into four scenes. There's the healing of the centurion's servant, which is telling us about trust in sickness and in health. There's the raising of the widow's son, which is about trust in life and death. There is the faith of John the Baptist, which is about trust in certainty and uncertainty. And there's the washing of Jesus' feet, which is about trust in sin and forgiveness. What do we know about Jesus? Let's look at scene one. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. This man deserves to have you do this. If you've ever had a loved one or a family member who has taken seriously ill, you will know the anguish that this household in Luke chapter 7 was going through. To watch someone you love endure pain and not be able to relieve that suffering is awful. We want that person to be restored to health because we believe they deserve it. Then there is the burden of care that comes with looking after someone, waiting at bedsides, visiting hospitals, seeking a cure or a relief that seems never to come when it is needed. And even when we know recovery is assured, there's still a process of pain and waiting to go through before healing is re realized. And should that illness become terminal or degenerate in some way, there is that sheer agony of watching a loved one fade away, never to return. And we think they don't deserve this. This scene in Luke 7 is now sadly familiar to us in a world of COVID. And with COVID, there's also the added thing that it's infectious and, and it prevents us from giving the care we know we should to those we love and those who are sick. We think no one deserves this. In this day and age, we expect governments and health services to guarantee our health. It's almost a human right. And even when we don't take care of ourselves the way we should, we expect others to do so. There's an expectation that we will live into old age. We have come to think that we deserve our health. Things, of course, were different in Jesus' day. There was no national health service, no intensive care, no antibiotics or chemotherapy, not even an aspirin or a paracetamol. Some elders of the Jews came to Jesus. They came pleading the case for none other than a centurion, a Roman soldier whose servant was sick and about to die. Here we have an enemy of the state of Israel, a commander of the forces of occupation, and yet the elders of the Jews came to Jesus to persuade Jesus that this enemy deserves his help. This man deserves to have you do this. He deserves it because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. This is the kind of faith that the Jews promoted in their day, a faith based on good deeds, on personal effort, and on social standing. We live in a society today of deserving people. Maybe you've noticed. We have rights, but little responsibility. We make demands, but sacrifice little. We are victims that deserve better than we get. But that's not what the gospel says. 
for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't deserve a gift. What we deserve are the wages. What we have earned is death. So what about this deserving centurion? What did he think? His response to Jesus is in complete contrast to the, uh, to the pleadings of the Jewish elders of the day. Jesus was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. I like to call these statements by the centurion three steps of faith first of all he says i do not deserve to have you here is a person who didn't consider himself worthy of christ's presence the centurion knew that there was nothing in his life that could ever earn him the right to stand in front of Jesus. There was nothing in his personal record, nothing he had accomplished, even building a synagogue, which could ever earn him the favor of God. I do not deserve Jesus. Until you and I realize that we don't deserve Jesus and that there is nothing that we can do to earn his blessing, but that he freely offers that gift of salvation. Until we come face to face with that reality, until we understand our own sinfulness and realize that we don't deserve anything other than the wages for our sin, until that point, we will never know true faith. Secondly, the centurion says to Jesus, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Just say the word, Jesus, and that will be enough. You don't even need to show me the spectacular stuff. You don't need to appear at my door. I don't need to see that light from heaven. I trust your word. Your word is enough, Jesus. There are those who, in their Christian faith, don't see God's word as enough. There are some of us who, whose faith depends on ever greater spiritual experiences and emotional highs. And if those things aren't forthcoming, we slip into lethargy. There are those who seek to rewrite God's word, proclaiming to be progressive. They think they can improve upon what God has said by being inclusive and by allowing those things God expressly forbids. And yet here is a Roman centurion, an enemy of Israel, a soldier no less, willing to depend entirely on the word of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, the centurion says, for I myself am a man under authority. You see, he understands what it means to be subject to authority. And so he subjects himself to the authority of the person he knows can heal the sick. I believe one of the greatest issues in our churches today is the lack of authority we give Jesus over our lives. We hear of Jesus being our savior. We hear of Jesus being our counselor. We hear of Jesus being worthy of praise, but we rarely hear of Jesus being Lord and master. Often what infects our churches is this idea that Jesus being our best mate wants what we want 
in life. We convince ourselves that Jesus exists to meet our desires and to allow us to live and be the person we are. But Jesus tells us, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. The centurion knew he did not deserve Jesus, but he trusted in Christ's word alone, and he made Jesus Lord and Master. Three steps to faith. And this is why Jesus was amazed and said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. What about you? Do you think you deserve to be here this morning? Do you think you deserve Christ's blessing? Do you believe you've earned your health or your salvation? Or are you prepared to trust the one and only Jesus Christ, the only one who can be trusted in both sickness and in health? Let's think about scene two of Luke 7. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain. I keep saying Nairn when I'm reading it, and I know I don't mean Nairn. Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, saw her his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. A dead person was carried out. Funerals are awful things. There is a terrible finality to a funeral. It's not just the end of a life, but the end of a relationship, the end of a, a, a lifelong love, the end of commitment, the end of a friendship, the end of marriage, the end of family, the end of potential, of hope, of future. Death is an end to all things. You don't come back from death. Unlike with the centurion's servant, Jesus wasn't asked to intervene with the funeral at Nain. No one pleaded with him earnestly to come and help, probably because everyone considered death was final. Even Jesus couldn't help with that. Just as our attitude to sickness and health has changed over the generations, so our attitude to death has also changed. Our current generation hasn't had the same experience of death as previous generations. Previous generations endured two world wars, one of which claimed the lives of 5% of the male population in the UK. Yesterday, I conducted a, a service, as, um, uh, as James was telling us, I, I, yesterday I conducted a service for D-Day, for D-Day veterans. We had a 102-year-old veteran from the 6th Highland Light Infantry who was there 77 years ago and we had a, a, over 100 veterans from various branches of the armed services at the service yesterday in Glasgow. The, that generation of people are aware of death. Generations before us had polio, cholera, tuberculosis. Death was a familiar part of life. I watched a program recently comparing the 1957 Spanish flu with the current COVID pandemic. And, and across the world, the death toll with density of population was about the same. It, was, it had the same impact. And yet in Britain, it hardly ever made the headlines. But in 2020, we have lockdowns, enforced restrictions, sensationalized reporting. In 1957, the government made hardly any response to the Spanish flu. What's changed? What's changed is our attitude to death. No one in 1957 thought it was a responsibility of government to protect us from a virus. Such an idea would have been ludicrous. Whereas today we expect the government to enact legislation to protect us from things that occur naturally around us. Maybe it hasn't. The investigation, the, the jury's still out on where COVID came from, of course. Today, we think that we can control things. We can control the environment. We have the power over life and death. We believe that we can do what God does. In fact, we believe we can do better than God. We even think we can save the planet. So when something like COVID comes along, it causes complete consternation because it exposes our human feelings and frailty. 
Yet we still expect that if we just put in some more effort, we can save ourselves. Just one more push, one more month of lockdowns, some more vaccines. It's a salvation by works. We think we can save ourselves. Just a little more human effort and it will all work. And yet still, death is inevitable for all of us. Or is it? When Jesus was confronted with his funeral in Nain, he had compassion for those whose lives had been devastated by death. A widow, already without a husband, now left without a son. But then Jesus went up and touched the coffin. And those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. There is only one person, only one with the power over life and death. There is only one person who has the authority to bring life into being and also to take it away. John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of men. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus, the word through whom all things were made, in him is the power to give life and the power to take life away. No one dies before their time. No one lives longer than they should. As death came into the world as a punishment for sin, so death is conquered when sin is conquered. And there is only one person who has conquered sin. Jesus carried our sins away on the cross, and in the resurrection, he carried death away. Death is no longer the end of things. It is rather a new beginning. As Revelation tells us, one day he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things. By then will have passed away. Death is a terrible thing. But it is not the end. In matters of life and death, it's not governments or health services that have the power of life. It's not scientists or climatologists who hold the answers to our future. It's not pharmaceutical comp companies that guarantee our health. Only God can do these things. In matters of life and death, only Jesus can be trusted. Are you trusting in the one person who has the true power over life and death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Let's look at our third scene in Luke 7. John's, John the Baptist's disciples told him about all these things that Jesus was doing. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or who was to come or should we expect someone else? That's a very strange question for John the Baptist to ask Jesus. Are you the one, Jesus? Are you the Messiah? Didn't John know the answer already? Wasn't he there baptizing Jesus when the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus? Didn't he hear God's voice say, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased? Wasn't Jesus the one that John's ministry in the wilderness was pointing to? The one coming whose sandals John declared he wasn't fit to untie? Why did John ask such question, such a question of Jesus? There, there are only two possibilities. Either John was doing his job and pointing others to Christ, or John was having a crisis of faith. So which is it? Personally, I think it might be a wee bit of both. You see, at this point in John's ministry, his work was at an end. He was being held captive by King Herod and surely knew that he was going to die. 
So he takes this opportunity to send two of his own disciples to Jesus with that question. John wanted his disciples to know what he already knew, that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. John was passing the baton. He was doing exactly what he'd done his whole ministry. He was preparing the way for Christ. But John the Baptist was also a human being and subject to all the frailty and doubt that we human beings experience. He was in prison. He was no longer able to deliver his ministry. He had no purpose and he was facing almost certain death. In those circumstances, it would not be surprising if even the faith of John the Baptist began to waver. Maybe he was genuinely looking for reassurance from Jesus. Maybe there was a bit of anxious panic beginning to develop in John the Baptist. You see, he knew he was going to die soon, so maybe his question was designed to force Jesus' hand, to hurry Jesus up, to get Jesus to publicly declare himself as the Messiah in some spectacular act of bravado so that John could turn to King Herod and say, See, I told you so. Maybe John wanted Jesus to get on with it, uh, to ascend the throne of Israel, to depose Herod, and in the process, save John's life. There are a lot of maybes in that, but those two possibilities still stand. And I think it was probably a bit of both. John pointing the way to Christ, but also seeking reassurance and certainty in times that were so uncertain. Today, we live in uncertain times. In the last year, everybody's life has changed forever. In the midst of this crisis, many have lost hope. Many have had their faith shaken. Many have entertained doubts. Many have faced death. Uncertainty and fear still controls us. Yet in the midst of his crisis, John the Baptist pointed the way to Christ still. As Christians, that pointing and preparing the way for others is ever more necessary when times are uncertain. How did Jesus answer John the Baptist? Basically, Jesus tells John to answer his own question. Who can make the blind see, the lame walk, the cure, who can cure the leper, he Heal the deaf and raise the dead. Who can do that, John? You know the answer, John. You know. How about you? Do you know? Jesus said, blessed is the man who is not ashamed of me. Especially in these uncertain times, we should not be ashamed to declare that our trust is in Christ. As we see human efforts fail, as we see human ingenuity challenged, as we see human authority disintegrate around the world, people need to be pointed to the one who can be trusted in certainty and uncertainty. Humankind needs to hear the good news, and we shouldn't be ashamed to tell it. As Hebrews reminds us, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. If you want to read a little bit about what Jesus' Jesus's reaction would be to, to our woke generation, read that passage from Luke 7, verse 31. It's a, a sermon in itself of how he replied to those who were saying one thing and doing the other and saying good things were bad and bad things were good. And he says, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. It is us declaring the wisdom of faith in these days that will point people to trust the only one who can be trusted in certainty and uncertainty. The last scene of Luke 7. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to that Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped, with, wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. 
When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. There's a little rhyme um, that I'm sure you've heard that goes something like this. Three people went for a walk, feeling, faith, and fact. Feeling took a bad fall, and faith was taken back. Faith walked close to feeling, faith was so close to feeling that he fell too. But fact remained and pulled faith up, and faith brought feeling too. We live in a society that runs on its emotions. And I would not be overstating things if I say that emotions dictate everything today. Emotions dictate how we vote. Don't kid yourself that it's all about the economy and education. Emotions drive the identity crisis. What we feel about ourselves dictates our sexuality, even our gender, regardless of biology and genetics. Emotions determine our social connections. How we feel about someone is more important than who they actually are. Black Lives Matter, Matter, Extinction Rebellion, and these m movements of protest today are fueled by emotions more than facts. We live in a society where how we feel determines everything. So where does faith fit into this emotional picture? In this last scene from Luke 7, Jesus is confronted by a woman who is clearly emotional. She can't even bring herself to face Jesus. Instead, with tears streaming down her face, she approaches Jesus from behind and kneels at his feet from behind. And using her tears, she washes his feet and then dries them off with her hair and, uh, and then applies that expensive um, alabaster perfume. Tears mixed with perfume, mixed with sweaty feet and hair. It's not a great picture that Luke is painting for us. And yet this scene is so poignant and heartwarming because the emotions that are on display reflect a heart that is genuinely overwhelmed with thankfulness and love. When Simon the Pharisee challenges Jesus about this woman's actions, Jesus tells him the story of two debtors, one who owed 100 denarius and the other who owed 50. And when their debt was cancelled by the moneylender, Jesus asked Simon, which of them will love the lender more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. Jesus continues, do you see this woman? I came to your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, Jesus isn't saying here that some people only need forgiven a little, while others need forgiven a lot, which is what Simon probably thought. What Jesus is saying is that some people only think they need to be forgiven a little, and so their display of gratitude is meager and reluctant, like Simon's, while this woman knew she needed forgiven much. And so her display of gratitude was overwhelming. She knew that she had been forgiven. And her display of emotion was overwhelming. What do you know about God? Where did this woman's display of emotion come from? What drove it? It was driven by her faith. By what she knew. Jesus said, your faith has saved you. It wasn't her display of emotion that saved her, but her faith in Jesus Christ. It's back to that poem again. This woman wasn't someone who lived on her emotions, as so many do today. This was a woman who knew the facts. She knew the forgiveness of Christ. She knew the reality of salvation in her life. In her, life. her emotions came from her faith, not the other way around. It is faith that saves, 
and faith rooted in facts, not emotions. We cannot trust our emotions. We cannot live by them. Such a life produces the kind of nonsense world we now live in where facts are no longer facts and reality is bent out of shape to fit the emotional. There is no wisdom in that kind of life. Rather, our emotions should be driven by our faith in the facts that Jesus is the only one who can be trusted when it comes to the forgiveness of sin. It's back to Alistair Begg in that video we saw at the beginning. Don't ask me how I feel. Ask me what I know. This woman knew her sins were forgiven. First John 1 says, If we claim to be without sin, We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What do you know about Jesus? In sickness and in health, in life and death, in certainty, uncertainty, in the forgiveness of sins, Christ can be trusted. Do you know this? Do you know your sins are forgiven? Have you followed those three steps to faith? Have you realized how unworthy you are? Have you put your trust in God's word? Have you made Christ Lord and Master? What do you know about Jesus? Thank you for joining us. To find out more about Teesside Christian Fellowship, visit tcfperth.org.uk. Together, we worship Jesus and communicate his love in all we do and say.